This episode of All In with Pastor Jordan Easley has been made possible by the generous support of viewers like you. Welcome to All In with Pastor Jordan Easley. Today's message is about to begin, and we invite you to prepare your heart and mind to hear an inspiring message from God's Word. We hope and pray for God to speak to you today as you seek to live your life all in for Jesus Christ. And now, from First Baptist Church in Cleveland, Tennessee, here is Pastor Jordan Easley. Have you ever wondered what makes Christianity a little bit different? Easter! Easter makes Christianity a little bit different. Listen, I have hope that the world doesn't have. And I've got a hope that's a no-so kind of hope, not a hope-so kind of hope. Anybody else with me on that today? Listen, I don't, I don't just hope that I'm forgiven. I don't just hope that I'm saved. I don't just hope that I go to heaven. Listen, I know I'm going to heaven. You know why? Because Jesus is alive and Jesus is different. Listen, the reason I have hope today can be summarized in the eight words that you find in Matthew chapter 28. In verse 6, it's the Easter story. Listen, the angels spoke to a couple of ladies, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus. And what did he say? He said, for he is not here, for he is risen. Listen, that's the reason I have the hope that I have today. It's the reason you should have hope today, because Jesus is different. Listen, it's different than any other so-called God that's walked on planet Earth. You know what? You could go for a tour all around this planet, and you can see the bones in the graveyard where many gods and great men have been buried. You can go and you can see Muhammad. You can see the bones of Confucius. You can see the bones of Joseph Smith and the place where Buddha was buried. But listen to me. I've been to the tomb of Jesus, and it is empty, y'all. It's empty. And it has been empty, and it's going to stay empty because you know why? He is alive. If you can't get a little fired up, something's wrong with you on that. That's a good one. That's a good one. Let me tell you a little secret about Easter. Let me tell you a secret about Easter. The devil hates Easter. The devil hates Easter Sunday. Now, he's okay with the bunny, and he's okay with the eggs, and he's okay with the pastels and men wearing bow ties. He can get over all that stuff. But what the devil hates about Easter is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He hates the resurrection of Jesus because the resurrection of Jesus is what guarantees his defeat. And it's also what guarantees our deliverance. That's why he's been deceiving people since the very beginning on that very first Easter Sunday. Listen, the devil hates Easter because Jesus is alive. And you know what? As, as certain as we are, there are some people around the world that want to convince you that that's not true. In fact, it shouldn't surprise us that as Christians around the world gather this weekend celebrating the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The American atheists are also having their 52nd annual convention in Atlanta, Georgia. It started on Friday night and it ends on Sunday night. And there are thousands of people gathered in the name of nothing. And what we are here today to celebrate, they are mocking. You know why? Because the devil hates the Easter story. He hates the fact that Jesus is alive. You know, I heard a story a while back about a teacher that was known for teaching her young children in her class her views as an atheist. Well, after several months of indoctrinating her class on her atheistic views, one day she asked her students to simply raise their hand if they agreed with her that there was no God. And in that moment, all the children in the class raised their hand, agreeing with the teacher that there was no God. Every student did it except for one little girl, and her name is Lucy. The teacher asked her why she decided to be different in that moment, and she said, because I am not an atheist. The teacher said, well, then what are you, Lucy? And Lucy responded, I'm a Christian. Well, that didn't please the teacher at all. So she asked Lucy why she was a Christian, and Lucy gave her defense and said, because I was brought up knowing and loving Jesus. My mom is a Christian. My dad is a Christian. And I, too, became a Christian. Well, the teacher was getting really upset and angry at that point, 
And she went on to say, Lucy, that's not a reason at all to be a Christian. She said, what if your mom was a fool? What if your dad were a fool? Then what would you be? She thought about it for a second. And then she smiled at her teacher and she said, well, then I guess I would be an atheist. (laughs) You see, Lucy wasn't just being a smart aleck in that moment. Lucy knew her Bible. In Psalm 14, verse one, it says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Let me tell you loud and clear today on this Easter Sunday, there is a God. And you can know that God because that God is alive and well. And he's been alive since the very beginning. Over the last several weeks, we've been talking about that God. In fact, we looked at the world that we live in and we acknowledged that this world was a world that God made. God made the world. And we saw the biblical account of the creation story from the book of Genesis. And we saw how God made everything that was created. And after creating everything, he looked at his creation and he said, it is very good. God made it. But you know what came next? A message called, we broke it. God made it, but we broke it. God's creation was created in perfection. The world wasn't created in chaos. We saw that the world was created in cosmos, in perfection. But the perfection of this world quickly changed with the presence of sin. You see, sin entered the world through Adam and Eve. And since that very moment, mankind has been born into sin and separated from a holy God. God made it. We broke it. Today's message, Jesus fixed it. What we broke, Jesus came to fix. That's what Easter is all about. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, Paul was talking to the Corinthians about Easter. And he told them, For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to to the scriptures. I find it interesting that when Paul talked about the most important thing, he talked about Jesus dying, Jesus being buried, and Jesus rising from the dead on the third day. And Paul told them that Jesus did these things, what? According to the scriptures, meaning Jesus not only claimed to be the Messiah, a lot of people were claiming to be the Messiah in Jesus's day, But he was showing that he proved that he was the Messiah because he fulfilled the prophecies in the scriptures. He didn't just die, he rose again, proving that he truly was the son of God. See, Jesus was God in the flesh. And he came to this earth to fix our greatest mess and to solve our greatest problem. Jesus came to erase the sin that separates us from God and to give us a hope that we can't do anything to deserve. See, because of what Jesus did on Easter Sunday, we have hope today. It's available for you right now. Because now we as sinners can be reconnected with the holy God that created us in the first place. And that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about the good news. We're talking about the gospel. Ever since Adam and Eve chose sin instead of choosing God in the garden, we've had this moment where we get to, to choose what we're going to do with God. You see, you and I were created with a sin nature, and I don't have to convince you today that you're a sinner. Every person in this room knows that you're a sinner. I mean, we can get real real slick, and we can show up like we've got our act together, but in our hearts, we know that we are a little bit messed up. That's our sin nature. It's a result of what happened in the garden. You see, the Bible talks about that in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. It says, for all of us have sinned, and fallen short of the glory of God. That says that we were all born into sin. And the Bible says that because of our sin, there is separation between us and God. There's separation between sinful us and holy God. But that hasn't stopped us from trying to get to God, has it? You know, all of us know what that's like. There's something intrinsically inside of us that wants to get to God. We desire eternal life. And because of that, we try our very best to get to him. In fact, I see it all the time. 
Just last week on an airplane, I was having a conversation with the person next to me. And I simply asked them a question. I said, hey, would you consider yourself to be a Christian? It's always an interesting question, by the way. But the response was very simple. After asking that question, this man looked at me and this is what he said. He said, sir, I am trying my very best to become a Christian. You see, humans have been trying to get to God for a long time. In fact, we may have somebody here today that's been trying to get to God. You've been trying to become a better version of yourself. You've been trying to earn your way to salvation or to heaven. Listen, we try to be good people. We try to make good choices. We try from time to time to give generously or to serve faithfully, and we show up to church when it's convenient. We try to have good marriages. We try to be good parents. And we hope that at the end of our life, When it's all over on planet earth, we just hope that the the good in our life will outweigh the bad in our life. And this good and generous and gracious God will somehow open the gates of heaven and allow us to experience heaven for all eternity. We hope and we try. The only problem with this idea of trying is what we read in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. You see, this verse talks about our attempts to get to God on our own. It says, there is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way to death. When you think about heaven being the desired destination of our heart, I think just about every one of us would say, man, we want to go to heaven. And yet when we think about that being the desired destination, it, it, it appears as if there should be multiple ways to get there. You can go this way or you can go that way. It's kind of like plugging a destination into your GPS. It'll say, you can go this way. It's going to take a little bit longer than this way. You can go this way. It's going to be a little bit more scenic than this way. There should be multiple ways to get to that desired destination. And yet when you look at the words of Jesus and when he talks about the way to heaven, he makes it very clear in speaking of himself in John chapter 14, verse six. He said, you want to know the way? He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Get this today. There's only one way to get to Jesus, and that's Jesus. There's only one way to get to heaven, and that's Jesus. There's only one way to experience eternal life of satisfaction and abundance, and that's through Jesus. Salvation has always required a sacrifice, which means in order for you and I to truly be saved and forgiven and seen as righteous in the eyes of God, in order for unholy people like us to enter into a real relationship with a holy God, the Bible says God would have to provide a sacrifice. And you know what? He did. He provided a sacrifice, a perfect sacrifice that was able to pay your sin debt and my sin debt. And he provided that sacrifice in the form of his one and only son. It's John chapter three, verse 16. It says, for God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. That next verse says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Do you get it? Jesus lived. And he died and then he rose again to prove that he truly was the Messiah. The Bible tells us he wasn't just a good man. He was the son of God and God the son. And since that moment in time, the moment he came and died and rose again, people like us have had the privilege of believing in him, trusting in him, giving our lives to him, following him. And yet even with that privilege and opportunity, there are still people on planet earth who have rejected him. Look at what it says in verse 18. It says, anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only son of God. That word believe is probably the most important word in the whole Bible because it shows us what's required for salvation. He said, if you want to be saved and forgiven and restored, if you want to have eternal life, you have to believe. The only problem with that word is when it's translated into the English, we get one word. It's the word believe. In the Bible, you have multiple ways of believing. But we just have this one word, so it's a little bit confusing. 
And when I say it's confusing, here's what I mean by that. Statistics show right now in America, 92% of Americans claim to believe in God. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that if the world ended today, that 92% of Americans would be in heaven for all of eternity? I can tell you right now, there's not a chance. The Bible says that the demons in hell believe in God. You ever read that? Do you believe the demons are going to heaven? They believe. The Bible says that Satan himself believes in God. In fact, the Bible says that Satan tempted Jesus for 40 days. Well, you have to believe in Jesus if you're going to tempt him. So when you see that word believe and you see all it requires is for me to believe in God to be saved, then the question has to be, do I have the right kind of belief? The kind of belief that Jesus requires for salvation. It would be a shame if I had the wrong kind of belief and I missed Jesus and I missed eternity in heaven. See, there are a lot of different ways that we can believe. For instance, I believe this is the greatest church in America. I can stand here and say that with confidence today. And I believe I could debate you. I'd be willing to argue that. But if I got real honest, my belief in that statement is based off of an opinion. I can also tell you that I believe right now that two plus two equals four. Anybody want to argue that? Two plus two equals four. And I can tell you that that belief is something that can be defended because that belief is based off of fact. I believe in a lot of people on planet earth that I've never actually seen with my own two eyes. Do you know somebody, do you believe that some people exist that you've never seen? I think we can all say that we believe that. And yet that belief is based off of 100% faith. I think about growing up. I love baseball growing up. I played baseball for a long time and I always wanted to be a pitcher. I just couldn't throw the ball fast. It's a problem if you want to be a pitcher. But growing up, I used to watch pitchers and I used to just be amazed at how hard they would throw. My favorite pitcher growing up was a guy named Nolan Ryan. Anybody remember Nolan Ryan? Let me just see, show of hands. Okay, a lot of you. I, I, I will stand here and say that I believe with all my heart that Nolan Ryan is the greatest pitcher to ever throw a ball. And I feel like I could defend that pretty well. You know, I believe in Nolan Ryan. I believe that he exists. And not only do I believe in Nolan Ryan, I, I know a lot about Nolan Ryan. It's weird, but I do. I can tell you right now that Nolan Ryan was born and raised in Alvin, Texas. Nolan Ryan had a dad who owned a newspaper company and every single day of Nolan's childhood, he would wake up before school and throw 1,500 newspapers at, all around his community. I can tell you at 12 years old, Nolan Ryan threw his first no-hitter in Little League Baseball. I can tell you Nolan was drafted in 1965 in the 12th rounds by the New York Mets. He played Major League Baseball for 27 years for the Mets, the Angels, the Astros, and the Rangers. He won 324 games in the big leagues. He had a career winning percentage of 526. He, he was an eight-time All-Star. He struck out 5,714 batters. He had seven career no-hitters. And today, Nolan still lives in Texas. He owns a cattle farm. He drives a pickup truck, and his favorite food is steak. <laughs> I, I know a lot about Nolan Ryan. In fact, it's a little embarrassing how much I know about Nolan Ryan. But I thought about that this week. See, I believe in Nolan Ryan, and I know a lot about Nolan Ryan. But my fear today is that maybe someone in this room, maybe someone within the sound of my voice believes in God the same way I believe in Nolan Ryan. We believe that God exists, and we even know a lot about God. But we've never met him personally. And you see, that's a problem. Because until you know God personally and have the right kind of belief, then you're not prepared for life on this earth to be over. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe in God today? Do you believe with the right kind of belief, the kind of belief that is required for salvation? Because when you read that text, it's not very confusing when you look at the original language. You see, it's a different word. It's a, it's a different kind of belief. In fact, He's talking about a specific kind of belief here, and he uses the word pistuo to paint a picture of what he's talking about. He said, you want to be saved, you want to be forgiven, then you have to have a pistuo kind of belief. It's an intimate belief that changes a person from the inside out. 
In fact, that word pastuo, it talks about uh, this, this belief that you have that's so strong in your life that there are literal consequences that result because of the belief that you have in your heart. It, def- it defines a kind of belief that, that changes a person's heart and their mind and their perspective and their actions and their priorities. It literally changes us by turning us inside out where it's impossible to be the person I used to be because this belief has transformed my heart and it's changed the trajectory of my life. And now as a result of this belief that I have in Jesus, I'm a new creation in Christ. And I got a different hope now and a different life. I have different language and different priorities. My mind is different. My heart is different. And I'm a new man because of what Jesus did in me. You see, he's talking about a specific kind of belief. And this is why it's so important that we get this today. Because verse 18 just told us when you don't have that kind of belief, guess what? You can be religious and you can be slick and you can try to become a better person every single day of your life. But he says, if you don't believe in Jesus, you will be condemned. And that condemnation, it paints an ugly picture. It paints an ugly picture of what it looks like to be eternally and spiritually dead. I'm talking about eternity here. And that's why this is such a big deal. Read it again in verse 18. He says, anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only son of God. But he goes on to say, if you do believe in Jesus like that, if you are willing to fully surrender your life to Christ, If you are willing to fully trust him in your world, if you're willing to walk by faith and pursue Jesus and take up your cross every single day and live for him, he said, you won't be condemned. You won't spiritually die. You won't be separated from the God who loves you and created you in the first place. But instead, he said, you can experience what it's like to be eternally alive. Man, I'm thankful for that. And yet God knows that some people in this place are facing a real fork in the road here. And he's saying, are you going to continue to go this way or that way? You're not going to sneak your way into heaven. You're not going to go partially in with Jesus and slip through the crack. You see, Jesus didn't come and live and suffer and die and rise again so that you could date him on Sunday and live however you want on Monday. He's not okay with being your weekend fling. Jesus isn't okay with that at all. He said, I came to be your savior, yes, but I also came to be your Lord. And if you're unwilling to to make me the Lord of your life and to surrender all to me, then don't think that your belief is an adequate belief. He's not okay with being your weekend boyfriend. He wants to be your king of kings and lord of lords, the one you depend on and follow and trust every single day of your life. Listen, do you believe in Jesus like that? Listen, you can continue to deny the fact that Jesus rose from the grave and you can continue to be wrong. You can continue to reject Jesus and pursue death as you chase the pleasures of this world and the pleasures of this flesh, and you can continue to live in sin. Or today could be the day where you surrender all and say, man, I don't care who knows, I don't care who sees, today is the day that I'm going all in with Jesus Christ. Today, I'm gonna run to Jesus and I'm gonna stop living a life where I am spiritually dead. And from this point on, I'm going to experience what it's like to be spiritually alive. And can you say that you're spiritually alive today? I really want you to think about this. I want you to define your belief today. Is your belief in Jesus an all-in kind of belief? Is it a kind of belief that has transformed you? Have you experienced what it's like not to pray a prayer or to be baptized? I'm talking about a spiritual renewal, a moment where the old you died and the new you rose. Are you spiritually alive today, men? Are we leading our families as men of God? Ladies, are you fully engaged and all in with Jesus Christ? Or has he transformed your heart and made you a new person? Students, are you there with Jesus? 
Or are you simply a Christian because you were born into a Christian home, living in a Christian community with a lot of Christian values? Listen, I'm not talking about any of that. I'm saying, has Jesus changed you and given you purpose and hope that you didn't have? Senior adults, are you ready to meet Jesus? You think Jesus is finished with you? Maybe the reason your heart is still beating and lungs are still breathing is for this moment in your life. Maybe God knows that you're not ready because you have the wrong kind of belief. Maybe maybe you need to step away from religion and step into a relationship and finally come to God with open hands and open arms and say, God, I need to be 100% yours. I give my life to Christ. Man, are you ready to meet Jesus? Are any of us ready to meet Jesus? Tell you what, I am. And I am because I've been saved. And I know I've been saved because I've been changed. And because I've been changed, I live with a different purpose. In Romans chapter 6, verse 13, it goes on to say, but as those who are alive from the dead, it's talking to us believers. He said, offer yourselves to God all and all the parts of yourselves to God as weapons for righteousness. For sin will not rule over you because you are not under the law, but under grace. He reminds us we are saved, not from the law. We're not saved from our behavior. You're not gonna go to heaven because you're a good boy or a good girl. You're going to heaven if you are saved by grace through faith. Which tells me that if there's someone here today that's ready and willing to forego everything else in their life and to completely focus on having faith in Jesus. If there's someone in this place that's ready to go from being spiritually dead to becoming spiritually alive, that God meets you at your point of need. He meets you in this place and he will radically change you if you'll let him. So here's what I wanna do. And this is gonna be a little weird, so prepare yourself. Normally preachers love to do the whole like, let's close our eyes and let's bow our heads and make it real easy to respond to Jesus. Here's what I want us to do. I want us to keep the lights up and I want to keep our faces up and our eyes aware because if somebody's ready to meet Jesus in this place, then nothing is going to stop them from saying yes to Christ. Not even a lot of people in a building. So before we do that, can I just say, if you're ready to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, if that's you, I want you to close your eyes. Everybody else, keep them open and say, Lord, I want to know you and I need you today. God, save me and change me and make me new. God, thank you for loving me and thank you for sending your son to die for me. And God, in the best way I know how, I give you my life, I give you my everything and I ask you to make me a new creation, a new person with a new hope and a new life God, I turn away from my sin and I turn to you as the King of kings and the Lord of lords of my life. God, I look forward to serving you. I wanna be a child of the King. Give me the courage to live for you and follow you all the days of my life. God, let me never ever forget this moment. Let my life be changed. God, give me courage today in Jesus' name, amen. I just believe that somebody prayed that and meant it. I just believe it. And so in just a second, here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. If you prayed that prayer and today is your day, I'm gonna ask for you to stand up. And you know what? You're gonna stand in in a room filled with people that are going to go crazy. They're gonna go bananas when you stand up. In fact, there may be some people that have been praying for you. And so when I say three, I want you to stand up. It's a one second response, by the way. If you know that this was your day, don't hesitate. Don't give the devil the satisfaction of your hesitation. Ready? One, two, three. All across the room, if today is your day. Praise God. Anybody else? Stand up if this is your day. Amen. Amen, buddy. Come on, man. Amen. Anybody else want to join them? Amen. 
I praise God for your courage, buddy. That's awesome. And we're celebrating you in the back as well. Let me just say this in a second. I'm going to pray when I say amen. If you're standing, I'm going to ask that you meet me behind these cameras. I just want to pray for you as we're talking about the next steps in your journey with the Lord. Uh, And if you didn't stand up and you should have, if you chickened out, it's not too late. I want to pray with you as well as we sing another song. But let me pray for us as we just celebrate what God has done in this place. Father, today we love you and we are grateful that you love us. Thank you for Easter. Thank you that we have hope today. May we never take the gospel for granted. God, thank you for continuing to save and change lives. And I pray that that we would be reminded of the hope that we have and how awesome it is that we serve a risen Savior in this place. We love you and we thank you for this time of worship. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. I know that most people watching this message today know what it's like to have their identities changed by God. I mean, you're watching a sermon on TV, but I can't help but think about that one person that's watching this right now that's never gone all in with Jesus and been changed by God. You know what's awesome about our God? He stands ready right now to forgive you of every sin you've ever committed. He stands ready right now to save you, to make you new, and to come into your life and change you from the inside out. Our God can do that right here and right now. You say, Jordan, what must I do to be saved? How can I know that Jesus has saved me and forgiven me and prepared me for eternity? Well, you know what it says in Romans 10 verse 9? It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Let me ask you real quick. Are you willing to make him your savior and Lord today? Are you willing to fully surrender your life to God in this moment? If so, then confess that to him. That says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Let me ask you, do you believe that today? Can you honestly say that you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead? Can you believe in your heart today that Jesus is who he claimed to be? That verse says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Are you ready to be saved today? Then pray this with me. Jesus, I know that I need you because I cannot save myself. Tell him I turn away from my sin and I turn to you because I believe you're the son of God. So in this moment, I'm asking you to step out of heaven and to step into my life. Save me, change me, make me new. Give me the courage to live for you. Give me the courage to follow you all the days of my life. And tell him, Lord, I pray that I will never, ever be ashamed of this decision to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer and began a real saving relationship with Christ, then the Bible indicates that the angels in heaven are rejoicing for you today. And in the same way, I want to rejoice with them. So do me a favor if you would. If you just prayed that prayer with me, I want to invite you to send me a message right now indicating the decision you made to follow Christ. You can do that in this moment by sending a text message. Text the word SAVED to the number 74784. And when your message arrives, the first thing we're going to do is pray and thank God. But next, we're going to text you back and we're going to celebrate with you. And then I'm going to send you a free gift in the mail that I believe will bless you big time as you begin this journey with the Lord. I am thankful for the men and women who financially support our ministry. It's because of their faithful giving that we can do this today. Thank you for watching this broadcast and just know, I pray God's very best over you today as you go all in with Him. Every single week, this broadcast is being made available to millions of people around the world, which means that every single week, there are scores of people learning God's word, being challenged in their faith, hearing the gospel, and even being saved. God is blessing the expansion of this ministry in a supernatural way. He's using people like you and the generous gifts of Christ's followers all around the world to make this broadcast possible. I want to invite you to consider joining our growing army of all-in friends and become a partner in this ministry. In fact, today, if you give a gift of any amount to this ministry, I'm going to send you a copy of my latest book, Escaping the Cage, just as a way of saying thank you. Thank you for believing in this ministry. 
And thank you for doing your part to advance the gospel message all around the world. If you would like to give a gift today, you can do that in a number of ways. The first way is you can send a text right now. Text the word BOOK to 74784. Or you can visit our website at goallin.tv and then click the Give button. Or you can send a check to All In to the address below. And when you give a gift, just know that you've got a gift coming back to you. As always, any gift that you make to this ministry is tax deductible. And I want to thank you in advance for your partnership and for your prayers. I'm praying God's best for you today as you go all in with Him. This episode of All In with Pastor Jordan Easley has been made possible by the generous support of viewers like you. We hope and pray for God to speak to you today as you seek to live your life all in for Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 12, verse 33, Jesus said, sell your possessions and give to the poor. For many years, I would read verses like this one and I would find ways to justify my disobedience because for a long time, I wasn't thinking about the poor. I wasn't using what God had given me to help resource people that were stuck in poverty. If I'm being honest, I've been a tither to my church and I've, I've given to missions, but even as a pastor and a Bible-believing Christian, there have been times when I wasn't leveraging my God-given blessings to be a blessing to others. What I love about Compassion International is they give people like us the opportunity to partner with them in being the hands and feet of Jesus to real people that are stuck in real poverty in real places around the world. And for just $38 a month, just a little over a dollar a day, my family is given the opportunity to not only provide food and sustenance to kids that are hungry and not only provide the funds that are necessary for a child to go to school, but I'm partnering with a gospel-centered ministry that puts real people on the ground. Missionaries that love the Lord and are living on mission and building relationships. Our family sponsors two kids in Nairobi, Kenya. Their names are Jabril and Zakia. And not long ago, I had the privilege of flying to their hometown and meeting my two compassion kids face to face. I met their families, we kicked a soccer ball, we shared a Coke, and they thanked me over and over again, not for sponsoring them, but for loving them. Today, Jesus reminds us all that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Man, would you join our family in sponsoring a child through compassion? If you'd like more information on how you can join in this mission, right now you can send a text. You can text the word COMPASSION to 74784, or you can click the Compassion link on our website at goallin.tv. I can promise you this. You can't spend $38 in a more effective or more mission-minded way than this.